Gosh, it's been nearly seven years since this movie came out. Seven years! And yet, people are still split on what they think of this portrayal of the most iconic superhero in the world. Throughout the years, my favouritism in comic book heroes has changed, starting with Spider-Man during the Sam Raimi period, Batman when the Arkham games were the rage, and then for a while, starting in 2013, it was Superman. That could have been when I was younger, my mindset wasn't as reformed or rational since anything that looked cool, and especially something I haven't seen before, would instantly hook me. But I'm still glad that this was the movie that got me liking and further understanding Superman as a character. That's not to say I wasn't familiar or aware of The Man of Tomorrow before this movie came out, and yes, I know the original starring Christopher Reeve is still favoured as the ultimate Superman portrayal, which I can totally understand since I enjoy the first flick myself, but you have to realise, as the years go on, you need to adapt and reform these characters the right way in order to match the current world we live in, as well as keeping the stories they take part in fresh and creative. I mean, take Superman Returns, where most of the criticisms was on how too familiar it seemed to the original movies, without any new or innovative ideas to make it stick out as its own thing. Now over the last few years, my perspective to Man of Steel, alongside a few other films that take place in this cinematic universe, have been all over the place, from overly praising it like an ignorant fanboy, to bashing and pointing out its weak points just so I could fit in with the majority of people who don't like this movie. But after finally getting a copy of it on Blu-ray, I decided to take the opportunity to rewatch it and hopefully put together my genuine, honest and definitive opinion on this take on Superman. So. Here it is. First off, let's start with the segment on Krypton, and right off the bat, you can tell that this movie's mission is to give its own identity and overall tone that's a lot more grounded, but still maintains that level and spectacle of fantasy. Speaking of spectacle, and thanks to my recent first viewing of 300, if there's one thing to credit the director, Zack Snyder, is that he is amazing when it comes to shot construction and visuals, because the overall look of this movie is just incredible. And not just the landscape and technology at Krypton, but there are so many stellar shots and surprisingly, the CGI quality holds up extremely well, dare I say it actually looks better than a lot of recent CGI heavy blockbusters. The only gripe I have with this film's presentation is that a lot of the time the camera movements come off as being too shaky, which I heard from some people saying the idea was to use that gimmick to make the scenarios appear more realistic and believable, but honestly I think they tried a bit too hard since, while it is impressive they managed to still incorporate the effects well, it comes off as being too distracting and disorienting, and so maybe if they kept these shots a bit more still, it would have been more beneficial and wouldn't change the scene's overall tone. So this gives us the introduction to the few reoccurring characters in this movie, Russell Crowe as kal father, Jor-El, is great. Whilst his traditional growly and somewhat neutral expression is present, he is merely a man of reasoning and wishes for his people to strive in the best way possible, and carries the embodiment of hope and determination, even if it means to let his own race die so that his son can live and guide him to inspire others to ensure they don't suffer the same fate as Krypton. Michael Shannon also delivers a marvellous portrayal as General Zod, purposely bred to be a leader of an army who wants nothing but the survival of his race, even if it leads to drastic measures that seem unethical. And so seeing him clash with Jor-El alongside their different ideologies are some of the best moments in the opening of this film. We'll start anew, we'll sever the degenerative bloodlines that led us to this state. And who will decide which bloodline survives on? You? So after Jor steals a Kryptonian artifact called the Codex, sends his son Cal to Earth and Zod alongside his crew gets sent to the Phantom Zone, the planet Krypton meets his expected doom and here is where the plot starts to take some similarities to Batman Begins. Throughout this movie there are several flashback sequences showing different points in Clark's time on Earth growing up, which is something I've heard some people had problems with. As for me, it really all depends on the selection of some of these segments since there are some that I like more than others, but overall, I'm perfectly fine with them, and if anything, I'm kind of glad we had them separated instead of all being shown at the beginning because one, it would have seemed too similar to the original film in 1978, and second, if they were joined together, 
it probably would have felt too much of a drag since pretty much all of them have a similar theme involving Clark coping with his powers and how it reflects off the folks around him. Like I said, there are certain flashbacks I like more than others. These include the one with Clark in elementary suffering from all of his enhanced senses, which shows at a young age he needed to find ways to hone them in order to have control, and also this other one being older, even though it does involve some pretty cliched bullies, has a key to helping Clark back up who he once saved despite picking on him in the past, and also shows what I think is one of the most defining aspects of Clark slash Superman, is that even though he is so powerful, he still prefers to retain his strength because not only would that possibly lead to further consequences, but also by doing good deeds to others can inspire them to help back when needed. Unfortunately, this also leads into one of my personal issues with this movie, and that's my inconsistent feelings towards Kevin Cosner's portrayal as Jonathan Kent. In one of these flashbacks, when Clark saves his classmates from drowning in a school bus, John talks to Clark about how they told him to keep his abilities a secret, which then leads to this following sentence. What was I supposed to do? Just let him die? Maybe. The way he responded to Clark's question is what makes a lot of people not like this version of John Kent, which I can understand if they just left it there, but everything else he says is rather similar to other incarnations of the character, so maybe if they just rework their bit of dialogue to something like, I don't know, or anything that doesn't exactly sound like letting them die because at the end of it, he still acts as a caring parent who wants to keep Clark safe from those who might fear his powers, but still knows that one day he'll need to make a decision what to do with them. It sounds complicated, but I guess that's just what adds to the realism of the relationship these two have. What I don't accept, and can agree with a lot of people, is how they treated John's death, where in another flashback a tornado appears causing a lot of people to escape from, but during this moment John decides to rescue the Kent's dog which results in him getting his leg damaged, enabling him to outrun the tornado. He even forces Clark not to come after him and instead pointlessly dies because he didn't want Clark getting discovered. My two major problems with this scene is that, why did John volunteer himself to go save the dog? Because it wouldn't be any different if Clark went instead. If anything, it would have been the better choice because even if the car did crash, they both would have gone out fine anyway. The other thing is that earlier on, it was mentioned that other people have already encountered Clark doing these extraordinary acts. So either something similar would have happened if they did see Clark doing the impossible, or better yet, maybe Clark could have found a way to save John but avoid getting noticed since it's very likely nobody was going to see beyond the destruction of the tornado anyway. You know, with like, super speed or something? Basically, it's a moment in which I highly doubt would have actually happened and even then, it kind of misses the point as to why John also died in the 1978 film since in that version, he died from a heart attack, or some sort of condition, that shows that no matter what Clark can do, that was a situation in which none of his powers would have been able to save him, and yet there could have been a few ways Clark could have prevented John's fate in this version. So pretty much throughout the first half of this movie is centred on Clark Kent, played by the oh-so-handsome fellow Brit Henry Cavill, who travels in the hopes of finding who he is and his overall purpose on Earth. During his travels, we see him take up various job positions as well as helping those in need, whether it's rescuing workers on a burning oil rig to standing up to a truck driver harassing a bar lady. It's during these moments we get a clear understanding of Clark as a character as well as his motives. Yes, everyone knows he's practically indestructible and also has incredible strength, but what I think a lot of people would tend to forget is that Clark has a choice what to do with his abilities, and despite having the option of doing nothing, he still chooses to save those workers because he thinks it's the right thing to do, and also without his aid, those workers would most likely be dead. And what I think greatly enhanced this case is when he talks to the driver at the bar, and despite being humiliated and even him attempting to hurt Clark, he still restrained himself knowing not only he can't be harmed, but also he decides not to use his powers as that would possibly lead to further trouble, and just being a decent human being is enough. Even though later he still wrecks the guy's truck anyway, but he gave him a chance and he didn't take it. Eventually, Clark leads himself to Ellesmere Island after hearing about a possible spacecraft under the ice, which is where we also get our introduction to Lois Lane, played by Amy Adams. Most of my experiences of different Lois Lane portrayals are pretty limited, 
Amy's Adam of the character is probably one of the best I've seen. She still maintains that determination vibe when seeking out stories, even if her stubbornness can get her into dangerous situations, but she also maintains a sense of understanding when the time needs it, which is particularly vital as her first encounter with Clark isn't at the Daily Planet, but rather she notices him around the crashed ship area, which then leads to her getting saved by Clark after being attacked by a Kryptonian droid. It's a change from the traditional storyline that I'm totally fine with, as it also leads to her finding out his identity by asking folks who have encountered him in the past, which is so refreshing as the possible mindset that someone as supposedly smart and driven wouldn't be able to notice that Clark and Superman are one and the same, and so her understanding why Clark favours to remain hidden so she's compassionate enough to keep that promise. So after Clark helps Lois and takes the ship away from the station area, he gets the ship systems working which leads to possibly two of my favourite scenes in the entire movie. The first being him meeting his father Jor-El for the first time, where you can sense that bit of joy in his expression of finally knowing who he is, but still confused and curious about his overall origin. Where do I come from? Why did you send me here? It's here in which Jor briefs Clark over the history of Krypton through some spectacular effects by the ship's tech, about the era in which they explored new worlds to settle upon, until it was abandoned over artificial population control, and that it led to causing Krypton's core to become unstable. Jor then shows Clark the Genesis Chamber, containing hundreds of Kryptonians, each of which were genetically designed to perform certain roles for Krypton, a system in which Jor and his wife fall negatively as it lost the element of choice for the children of Krypton. What if a child dreamed of becoming something other than what society had intended for him or her? What if a child aspired to something greater? And so this is where Jor advises Clark he can embody the best of both worlds and use his abilities to give hope to the people of Earth and inspire them to become greater in the best way they can be. Now, donning his awesome new suit, we come to my second and all-time favourite scene, where we see Clark test the limits of his powers to even showing his first experiences in flying that leaves him gleaming with joy. Even when he loses control and crashes, he doesn't give up and tries again, this time leaving the icy mountains and flies over various landscapes. What more can I say that isn't being shown? Just the scope and overall feeling this scene gives you is just incredibly accelerating and fun. Not to mention the track and accompanying this scene titled Flight is just incredible. Which is the same that you can say about the entire movie soundtrack composed by the brilliant Hans Zimmer. Each selection of tracks hopes to present and enhance the particular vibe whether it's centered on Superman, where it starts off being sentimental and it builds up to be grand and inspiring, to the ominous and dreary vibe it gives off to show Zod's side of domination and power. Speaking of Zod, this is where we get into the focus on the second half of this movie, featuring this brilliantly eerie moment where Zod takes over the screens on Earth and demands kal to be handed over to him. To kal I say this. Surrender within 24 hours. Wow. Or watch this world suffer the consequences. consequences. After this, it then leads to Lewis being arrested by the FBI and Clark, unsure of what to do, speaks with a priest in a church and actually reveals himself in order to ask for guidance. A common thing I tend to hear is that they seem to overly resemble to the religious side and present Superman as a figure of Jesus, which I want to say is that I think they got the wrong idea as to what the scene is supposed to represent. It's not the resemblance that's the focus, even if this one shot looks to be, and besides, I wasn't even noticing the first time I saw it, but rather this moment shows that despite knowing that Zod can't be trusted, he still wonders if he should reveal himself as he fears the world could look at him in a negative way, and all he can do is to talk to someone he feels is as good hearted as he is in order to choose the right path for peace. Sometimes you have to take a leap of faith first. The trust part comes later. 
This leads to yet another great moment where Clark reveals himself to the military and willingly turns himself over in order to release Lewis, as well as reassure them he means no harm. Even if it leads to a rather humorous moment where Superman snaps the cuffs off of Ease, but still informs the General and everyone else he's just as concerned about Earth as they are. Be that as it may, I've been given orders to hand you over to him. Do what you have to do, General. We then get our proper introduction to Subcommander Furora L, played by, forgive me if I pronounce this wrong, Andrea Trower, who is an absolute delight whenever she takes front of stage. She is so collective and menacing in her delivery, which really shines later on when she takes on Clark, as well as the rest of the military later on. It is here where Clark is finally introduced to General Zod, but doesn't go too well, as adapting to Earth's ecology and not Krypton's leads to him passing out. But soon awakens to Zod explaining how they escaped after Krypton's destruction, and that the ship Clark reactivated called their attention. You led us here, Cap. And now it's within your power to save what remains of your race. He then shows Clark what the Codex his father took can be used to bring back the people of Krypton still in the Genesis Chamber, but in order to adapt, they would have to reform Earth with the World Engine, causing all the inhabitants to die in the process. He was where I think sometimes that maybe Zod should have used a different approach to persuade Clark, or at least tricking him into handing over the Codex, because then Clark is obviously going to try and stop them. But I guess now looking into it, Zod believes he is superior to Clark in every way and that whatever attempts he'll make will just fail. It's that form of intellect that blocks him from seeing the possibilities. Or at least that's how I'm seeing it. Elsewhere, Lewis is held captive in which, if you're wondering why they brought her on board in the first place, she mentions later they also attempted to get information out of her, so I kind of wish we had a chance to see that happen on screen, but whatever. After using the command key Clark gave her earlier, she manages to upload Jorah's consciousness into the ship's mainframe, allowing him to tell Lewis how to stop Zod, as well as giving us a pretty fun segment aiding Lewis to escape, and soon after briefly talks to Clark one last time he can save everyone on Earth, which then leads to Clark racing towards Lewis to save her from crashing. And so we come to the part of the movie where a lot of people start bitching and complaining without taking it into perspective, as Clark swoops in to save his mother from Zod, accidentally crashing into various properties because if you were in that scenario, would you be focusing on where you're flying instead of doing all you can to protect your loved one? I didn't think so. Thankfully, this results in Zod's helmet getting damaged, causing him to experience all of his senses, similar to Clark once did, forcing him to abandon the field leaving it towards Ferora and Namek to take on Superman. And this right here is the pinnacle of what it would look like if Kryptonians battled on Earth. I'm telling you, the action and fight sequences during this scene is just amazing. It's fast paced, feels impactful from the amount of strength they're showing, and not to mention, it clearly shows the difference between Superman's inexperienced approach and the more trained, bred for combat members of Zod's army. Unfortunately, most OG fans for some reason can't get behind these fights for various reasons I shall address and explain my confusion. The first and most obvious being is that they say it's too destructive and that Superman shouldn't kill or let people die in the process. Um, have you seen modern comic book movies? Of course it's going to be destruction and the possibility of people getting hurt. This isn't the late 70s and early 80s because that's just too unrealistic. Also, while we do see some soldiers getting killed by Zod's people, we never see Superman directly responsible for murdering anybody, and even then, there aren't any shots of dead civilians, so why do people claim to this being possible if we don't see it? And what they also seem to not realise is that this is Superman's first fight against anyone with the same strength and capabilities, so obviously he's going to struggle, and not to mention, we see a few times of him trying to lead them out of the town but fail to do so, which clearly shows he cares about the people in Smallville, but there's no choice but to fight them where they're at right now. Lastly, this stupid claim that Superman barely saves anyone is just ridiculous as there are numerous times Superman both warns and saves the people in Smallville. The first being him telling everyone to get inside before they start fighting. Get inside. It's not safe. The second being one of the jet pilots before Ferora crashes into him. Oh shit. 
Then there's one of the soldiers falling out of the helicopter, which is an no bueno. You okay? And finally, there's Colonel Hardy before he gets attacked by Ferrara, who also was the most unsure about the Kryptonians until Clark's actions made him understand. So your belief that Superman barely saves anyone is absolutely false. This man is not our enemy. Thank you, Colonel. After retreating, however, a member of Zard's crew informs him that when jor took the Codex, which contained the DNA of a billion Kryptonians, he bonded it with kal own cells, and that he doesn't need to be alive in order for them to extract the DNA to bring them back. Thus, Zard begins the sequence to terraform Earth so that they, alongside the other Kryptonians, can live on Earth, wiping out humanity in the process. Thankfully, elsewhere, Clark and Lewis reunite with the US General and explain that by colliding Clark's craft with Zard's ship, the technology from both would generate a doorway and send Zard's crew back to the Phantom Zone. The singularity can be created. Like a black hole. Yes. So if we open up this doorway, then theoretically they should be pulled back in. So after agreeing, the team split, with Lewis and the Colonel sending the craft to Metropolis to be dropped, whilst Clark heads off to destroy the world engine over the Indian Ocean because with it still running, the other control gravity will prevent them from succeeding. Meanwhile, after taking the time to quickly hone his senses because of his superior genetics as a warrior, Zod takes control of the ship containing the Genesis Chamber right after our last moment with Joel before he wipes him from the ship's mainframe. And so during all of this, whilst the military attempts to take on the main ship, which leads to them accidentally killing civilians by the way, Superman is seen struggling not just from the air around the engine, but also it sends out a cool looking defense system that ends up throwing Clark right into the center of the gravity change. Northcom, this is Guardian. Are we cleared to make the drop? Negative, Guardian. But ultimately, this brings us to yet another astonishing moment as where it seems everything is at its loss, Clark heroically lifts himself up, taking the whole power of the ship, which gives us a rather touching easter egg as the massive force briefly forms Henry's face to resemble Christopher Reeve, the greatest Superman before him, and then uses all of his strength to fly up and charge straight into the machine, blowing into pieces. With one half of the problem solved, Lewis and the crew on board the aircraft proceed to drop the pod, However, an error occurs with the command key, and also they get interrupted by Zard, who prepares to take them out. Thankfully, Clark arrives all healed up, and despite Zard begging him to stop, Clark proceeds into cutting the power, causing him and Zard to crash into the city. However, Jesus, a lot is going on, isn't it? Ferrara, as a last minute attempt, gets onto the aircraft, taking out nearly all the crew members, but Mr. Hamilton solves the issue of the pod and activates it forcing the colonel to crash the plane into the ship, but Lewis gets launched out, allowing Clark to save her from being sucked into the implosion. So this whole segment shows that after the uncertainty of one another, both Clark and the military have come to trust one another in order to ensure the safety of everyone on Earth. Not to mention, with the drastic difference from one another, and that Clark isn't at its full potential, it was necessary he needed help and that they had to split with different objectives. Also, if you're wondering why Lois had to be with the Colonel on the aircraft, it's because she was the only one at the time who knew the basic functions of the command key and pod, thanks to jor -El. And finally, to conclude the argument of Clark's count rate of saving people, he single-handedly ensures the safety of the entire human race by destroying the world engine, allowing the military to finish the job afterwards. But it's not over yet, as almost right after, we find Zod kneeling over the wreckage in grief. And this little moment where he tells Clark he'd do whatever it takes to ensure Krypton's safety, and now that it's all gone, gives us a slight bit of sympathy for him. I exist only to protect Krypton. That is the sole purpose for which I was born. And every action I take, no matter how violent or how cruel, is for the greater good of my people. 
this pisses him off so bad. He ensures Clark is going to make humanity suffer, but Clark won't have that, and so we come to the final battle, which, like the fight in Smallville, is quite the thrill ride. Even if it can seem a little out of hand at times, it still offers multiple segments that stick out, including that it shows distinctive fighting styles on the ground, in the air once Zod learns to defy gravity, and even a quick moment in space. Not to mention the two quick easter eggs representing LexCorp and Wayne Enterprises, both in which a lot of us were really anticipating for the sequel, but ultimately that went quite south. Well, one more than the other. Lastly, this further shows a pretty cool detail whenever Clark and Zod use their heat vision, it shows them reacting as if it puts a bit of a strain on their eyes. Which speaking of, after duking it out for a bit, it leads to probably the biggest controversy of this movie. Where Clark has Zod locked in position, but Zod proceeds to wipe out a family with his heat vision. And so, in the middle of this tense situation, Clark ends up doing the unthinkable and breaks Zod's neck. This was a moment that I didn't hate when seeing it, if anything it shocked me, but I still believed it was understandable because remember, this is still a fresh Superman with little experience and no proper mental training, so to him it felt like it was the only solution to save that family. And also, in the aftermath you can clearly see this hits Clark hard emotionally, the fact that he personally killed someone, and also it was the only other Kryptonian on Earth, therefore making him feel lonely, despite Lewis's support for him after. Unfortunately, that gets tossed over aside right away in the next scene involving Clark taking out surveillance drones because the military are tracking him down, and requesting the general to convince the government about his actions. It's such a sudden change that kind of affects the ending of this movie as a bit of time showing Clark coping with what he's done to him moving on to continue being an inspiration to humanity would have been necessary. But then again, I can't deny seeing his younger self wearing a red cape in the iconic Superman pose was kind of touching. And despite nobody realizing before he put his glasses on in the elevator, seeing him joining the Daily Planet was also pretty cool, ending with Lois greeting him with a phrase that has that double meaning. Welcome to the planet. Glad to be here, Lois. God, that theme always gets me going. And no better way to finish off what I would say is a somewhat underrated comic book movie. As I said at the beginning, this movie is now 7 years old, and since then, future DC movies have made quite the transition in style and tone. And from the looks of it, it seems the majority have made positive comments on where they're at right now. While I can say I've had fun with the likes of Aquaman and Shazam, there was just something about Man of Steel that just makes it more special as I've had just as much enjoyment watching it, whilst at the same time it has its own merits and qualities that helps to make it separate from most modern comic book movies, that helps to make it more distinctive and unique. Which I'm guessing at the time was something that a lot of people were just not ready for, as it did seem very different from the older movies, particularly since the overall task again was to bring Superman to a more realistic world and time period, which I think they succeeded with the changes and updated portrayals. Of course, my main complaints were the back and forth likings towards this version of Jonathan Kent, as well as the rushed ending to finish on a more positive note, but thankfully, the rest of this flick contains enough thought-provoking and fun moments for me to have a good time with. It's rather unfortunate though that the next instalment after this left such a bad taste in my mouth, even with the occasional high moments, that it caused the studio to rethink and change up their future projects, and that there was once going to be a completely different version of Justice League that we're never going to see. If they just decided to space out with a few more movies focusing on their other DC characters, then I honestly think they still would have succeeded, but still keeping that distinctive tone of Man of Steel that would have helped to separate it from the MCU. My point in all of this is that Man of Steel was an ambitious breath of fresh air for the comic book movie industry, even with the split opinions amongst fans, that I think makes it a little bit more memorable before later years pass with the abundance of other films, mostly from Marvel, that somewhat makes them appear too samey, with the occasional outstanding pieces that make a greater impact. So whatever the future of this industry is heading into the new decade, particularly with what they are planning with their most iconic hero next to Batman, 
I just hope that they give Henry Cavill a second chance as, personally, there is no other possible replacement they could pull off with the modern iteration of the Man of Steel. Only time will tell. But as of now, I'm just really fortunate that this movie does exist as without it, I probably wouldn't be as invested in the character to the point at which I'd be able to criticise and identify the best iterations, as well as visualise the possibilities for the future. To that I say, thank you.